Perfect. Oh, thank you for joining uh, Mid City Neighborhood Organization. Uh, tonight's meeting, unfortunately, was moved to remote location, or, <laughs> or at least uh, remote format for this meeting. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody really wants to sit outside, even in a covered area in 105 feet index. Um, it, it was our best intentions to meet everybody in person for the first time in a long time, but uh, I think we'll try and regroup and redo that uh, coming up in August. So as people are joining in, I wanna give you all a copy of today's agenda, um, kind of light, but, but plenty of topics to discuss uh, with our visiting council members. Um, if you could please bear with me, but we have a few announcements from uh, MCNL that I wanted to make before we move on to our first couple items. Um, so right now, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that we are working to seek a vacancy in the Mid-City Security District Board of Commissioners. A former commissioner recently passed away, Mr. William Walther, which leaves a vacancy for a commissioner uh, required to reside in the City Park Triangle area. So those are the boundaries of Orleans Avenue, City Park Avenue, and North Carrollton. Those meetings are usually held on the third Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. Um, and you would be appointed to be to serve the remainder of the term that would expire in July of 2023 um, and possible reconfirmation for an additional three-year term. So the it, it's a significant commitment to serve on, on the board and there's a lot of decision makings, uh, especially financial decision makings on how uh, the security district funds are expended. Um, so please, if you're interested, uh, reach out to me this email address, president at mcno.org. Um, and we can follow up with a few questions and uh, keep you up to date on the process. Uh, the require the This one commissioner seat is required to live in those boundaries specifically by the statute that established the Mid-City uh, Mid Security District. And the only requirement is that you be a registered voter uh, in that area. So please reach out. Um, We've already approached City Park Neighborhood Association. I believe they're working through a few interested parties and we want to just cast that net even wider, see if we have anyone who may be interested in that area. Um, I want to thank uh, the MCNO board for putting together you know, a, a statement public letter to uh, the owners of uh, the Mercy Hospital site and the board of St. Margaret's. Um, I thought it was well received by a lot of residents. We got nothing but positive feedback, but also continued frustrations. But I know the board worked hard to craft uh, an eloquent letter and I wanted to publicly thank them uh, at our meeting and kind of show you what, what we've been working on. Um, I also want to thank all of our supporters from Give NOLA Day. We raised $635 from 14 individual donors for MCNO. Um, that helps us maintain uh, you know, meeting supplies, event supplies, um, we'll be back to more regularly scheduled trash cleanups and what throughout the neighborhood and beautification efforts. So thank you for your support financially. Um, as far as manpower, we had a out hurricane preparedness outreach event. I want to thank our volunteers for that, uh, that came out and flyered specific areas of mid city to make sure to get people signed up for hurricane uh, alerts, as well as uh, information on city-assisted evacuation as we are now entering hurricane season once again. So thank you to all of our board members and Thomas Ecker for organizing that event for us this past weekend. Uh, I wanted to talk one quick note. Uh, we have received requests to uh, submit letters of public comment on a project being proposed by Sewage and Water Board. Um, I wanna share that information very quickly. Um, they're seeking some uh, RFPs for public funding to do a green infrastructure development on this location um, adjacent to the Mid City Post Office and, and Bayou St. John. And specifically, I think they're looking for support from the neighborhood for a um, connector uh, which would bring the greenway into that uh, into that green site, green infrastructure site right there. Um, you know, Toulouse to uh, Norman Francis and Orleans. Um, 
And so uh, I'm going to be approaching the board to vote on crafting a letter of support. And I'd love some more input on, on that item. Uh, if you could help us out on, on what would be the best, you know, the, the greatest impacts for a project like this, please let us know. Um, it will help us write a very more effective letter, hopefully securing their funding. So, and let me double check. I think if I have one more uh, announcement. Um, you know, we're still always looking for volunteer uh, from the community to help us out with different things here. Uh, we could always use help with communications, publishing updates, getting things out um, either reliably on time, sometimes, you know, meeting notices, agendas, finalizing certain planning, um, different outreach events, uh, maintaining our, our membership uh, records, uh, planning and events execution, as well as, um, you know, uh, committing time to attending other public meetings that are of interest to the neighborhood and report back. Um, because that can take a lot of time, especially now that more meetings are returning to in-person and maybe dropping a uh, remote component. I know myself have been able to attend a lot more meetings during COVID just because it's a lot more convenient not having to move around town. But if anybody does attend either NOPD non-PAC meetings or uh, other community groups that may be meeting in Mid-City with pertinent information or uh, would like to help us out in, in just trying to stay informed and keep our neighborhood informed, please reach out. We have many, many ideas and open to ideas for more volunteer efforts and organization and outreach. So please get in touch. All right, that's all I had to start off with. Uh, Council Member Banks, would you like to lead off this evening? Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for um for allowing me to speak and to join you this evening. I hope everyone is well. I will start off with what I hope you all will receive as good news. Um, I have been in touch with the new owners of the hospital. Uh, the ownership was transferred less than a week ago. Um, we do hope to have some real progress on getting uh, that I saw in a much more uh, neighborhood friendly condition. Uh, you all may have noticed lights are going up. There have been some energy poles installed and I think that those lights are actually functioning now. Um, they've run the test on the water. There's about four or five feet of water in the basement. Uh, they've got to pump that out before any real work starts, um, but they got the test results back fortunately there's no toxic waste in the water, so it's okay to pump the water into the, uh, into the sewer system and the drainage system. And that'll start hopefully within the next few days. Clearly they aren't gonna be pumping if we're in the middle of a rainstorm because you don't want to overburden the system. Um, the trash pickup will be starting in the next couple of days and will be ongoing. The hope is to put up a new perimeter fence, a seven foot tall fence um, the difficulty with that fence at this point is getting it. COVID has put pressure on every manufacturer of anything being manufactured, everywhere it's being manufactured. So they have not yet been able to acquire the seven foot fence. If they can't get the seven foot fence, they're gonna put up a new, I think that's a five or six foot fence out there. They're gonna put up a new fence uh, in the hope that um, they can help to keep people out. The long-term plan is for it to be um, a senior assisted living facility with an emphasis on Alzheimer's care. Um, and uh, that is the hope. The applications going to HUD and the other governmental regulatory agencies that deal with all of that good stuff, they've started that process. Construction uh, is not going to happen for a while. They've got to get all these ducks lined up. But even if nothing else happens, at least it's going to be put into a much more neighborhood friendly state. So um, I would hope that, um, that that most people are pleased with that. Um, they asked about the graffiti. We had a long conversation about the graffiti. Um, the issue with the graffiti, they priced having the graffiti removed. Um, it's going to come in at about $180,000. The problem with removing it is that 
we don't want them to go back and tag it again. So they're going to get that removed, but closer to the actual construction time to not have to spend almost 200 grand and waste it. So um, that is, uh, I think, good news. I'm very excited about it. Um, and again, they went to active sale. They closed last Tuesday, less than a week ago. So we've had pretty good progress in that week window. And uh, you should be seeing much, much more moving forward. Um, that was my big piece. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, and um, I'm here for you if I can do something. Well, thank you for that good news. Uh, can you share the, the ownership group or the, or the transferred party? Paul Flowers, principal. I don't know. Other, um, I don't know all the other players. Paul Flowers is one. Uh, the Jaeger group is out. And, and Paul Flowers and his folks are in. So that's who it is. You know, can I ask Margaret, a question? Uh, let me, uh, can I ask, uh, is St. Margaret still involved, do you know? Is who? Is St. Margaret still involved? St. Margaret is, I don't know exactly the contract, but the housing stuff is going to be an adjunct to what they're doing. So their name definitely was in the conversation several times, but how that, how that relationship is confected, that I don't know. But they were okay. definitely the discussion when they were talking about it, there is still some relationship with St. Margaret's, absolutely. Go ahead, Mary. Um, is anything gonna be done about security for the site, like a security person, you know, while this is trying to be straightened out? We did not talk about that, but I will be happy to ask that and then report back to you guys. Um, they are gonna have a significant investment in this thing, obviously. So I'm pretty sure that they want to have it uh, safe as they can make it. We did not discuss that. I did not think to ask that, but I will follow up with them and report back to you all. Because these the, the vandals have been able to breach anything, you know, going over and under through fences and into that building. And um, it seems like anything they do will be undone if there isn't some, some type of security to the building. I will follow up and, and give you uh, an answer back. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm a little shocked. <laughs> Caught no, me quiet. I, <laughs> uh, again, we, we, I appreciate the opportunity. I am going to have a staff person on the call. The, the good part about Zoom is that you don't have to leave to go and do it. The bad part about Zoom is you're expected to be everywhere. So sure. I, I actually have two other meetings that are started at six. So okay. if you um, about this one and go to the second one and then go to the third one. We have but one, we one, have one more. more uh, we have one more raised hand. Clay Thomas, just raise his hand. Hi. Uh, you can hear me, I guess. Yes. Um, yep. So um, I, I have a place at 2426 Braddy Alley. It's right behind the 24242 Lane apartment complex. And since that apartment complex has come online, the um, overflow of rainwater that doesn't go through what they have deemed their system comes out onto my property and floods me. And I talked to Mrs. Brock um, from your office, and I do appreciate to know that there's going to be a road that is put into place starting in August of this year, but I don't think that that's going to address the problem because it shouldn't be coming out of there in the first place. They, this is an emergency overflow, as from what I understood from the engineers and the builders that I talked to, and that if, if water is coming out of there, then something is broken in the system. And so when I talked to the building maintenance guy, Chris, he said, definitely, Something's broken down. We've been trying to contact the city. They haven't been responding. They feel like there's some sort of blockage in the two-lane sewer because even two-lane, they have two downspouts that go to two-lane, and it gushes down those, and it doesn't soak up all the water. And so I have water for four days, and it, it, it's not 
uh, the best situation. But I've also, as the bigger picture is, if this is the green model that New Orleans is taking by trying to build reservoirs underneath buildings to hold the rainwater capacity, this is not working according to this building. And that's what I wanted to say. And I do, do appreciate you following up with the sewage water board and filing something for, you know, to, to, for them to investigate. I did get that email and I do appreciate that. Um, but I think in the long run, I don't think that's going to do as much good as everybody thinks it's going to. And I'll go mute. Well, Mr. Clay, I, I'm sorry that you're experiencing this. Um, we are going to be intentional on trying to figure out just what's wrong. Um, forgive me, I'm not an engineer. I know what I know, but I'm also never embarrassed to admit what I don't know. So I can't tell you where the, the actual blockage of the problem is. I do know that um, Sewage and Water Board is going to try to figure out if there is a blockage. Um, I do know that we're going to have the street redone, and that may or may not help, but that's down the road. So we've got the concern, and we will follow up to try to get it remedied. And we've been intentional on trying to get it remedied. But sitting here right now, I can't tell you I can't tell you what's broken. I can tell you, though, that I would hope that more projects would impart, uh, impose on themselves uh, water retention. We have a real problem. Uh, we live in a tropical climate and below sea level. I'm hoping that this is an anomaly and that um, water retention does not end up being a bigger problem, creating a bigger problem than it fixed, because I think it's imperative that we have it. We've got to do something with it. We are going to get massive amounts of rain. The water will not drain out. We've got to pump it out, and we've got a system that has a limited capacity. So the idea of retaining water until the pressure is off and you can pump it is something that I think we've got to do. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know the specifics as to why yours or why your neighborhood is having this issue, but we will try to get to the bottom of it and have it remedied. Got another hand up from Mary Meising. Uh, again, this one's a little off topic, but I, I know a number of the neighbors are still very concerned about that bike, pa ba uh, bike path proposal on Bienville between Carrollton and Norman Francis. And um, the uh, Complete Streets group has indicated that that's the end of the discussion. And it's like they did not listen to any input at all in terms of objections. And I just wondered, is there another alternative, another route that um, people can follow to, you know, voice their opinions and maybe have them heard? I would hope that you would call the mayor's office. I have been and I have gotten beat up on multiple occasions. I'm not anti-bike. I get the benefit of having bike paths. I get the benefit of lessening the carbon emissions. I get the fact that many of us are obese and could use the exercise. I get all of that. What I don't get is why do we have to have the bike paths on major streets? If speed is the issue, speed kills, I don't understand why the bike paths can't go on the side streets. I think they need to be as least impactful to the flow of traffic as possible. Now, that has gotten uh, no traction from those folks. I am probably enemy with them because I am not in favor of most of these bike paths where they're located. I will continue to say that they ought to be on side streets. The speed limit is less, speed kills, so why not put them where they would have the most likelihood of having somebody safe? And the arguments don't make any sense to me. So um, call the mayor. Um, it's not a call that we, we don't have a direct line to it. I have repeatedly asked that it not be where it is. There are multiple ones. So... I would appreciate your your voices and coming sing in the choir with me about we need to move them. Thank you. And again, and I want to emphasize, and I keep saying this, I'm not opposed to the concept of bikes. I mean, I'm a kid from New Orleans. I grew up riding a bike. All right. So that's not the issue. The issue is they don't need to be where they are. Bienville has way too much traffic, in my opinion. It doesn't need to be there. Simon Bolivar, Barone Street. Why can't we put them on a side street? It just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm not anti-bike. I'm anti the way that it's being implemented. All right, let's call for any 
Comment or question for a council member? Mr. Klassen? You are muted, sir. And I don't... Is it me or... No, sir. I believe it's Mr. Klassen. Sorry, the council member's direct email address is in the is in the agenda. Uh, you can contact his office through there or, or any other representatives. Um, if you want to do a written comment or or reach out by phone to his office, that information is on the agenda as well. So, all right. Thank you so much, Mr. Banks. All right. Well, thank you. And again, I will have uh, Avis Brock. I see one of my directors of constituent services. She's on the on the on the call. So, if there's any other questions. Uh, give to her or email me or whatever else I can do. Please let me know and I will be happy to try to assist. Thank you all. God bless everybody. Be safe. Thank you for the news. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Take care. See y'all later. All right. Well, that was incredible information I wasn't aware of prior to this evening's meeting. So um, Mr. Giarosa has to follow that up. I was about to say, that's a hard act to follow, but I'll try and do my best. Um, it, it's good seeing everybody. I do want to start with something that I know has been an interest for this neighborhood, but make sure that it's explained. And I know, Chris, you, you've been dealing with this a whole lot. At some point soon, we will be receiving the Chick-fil-A conditional use. And remember, the council has approved the Chick-fil-A's in both districts B and C. I'm keenly aware of both um, substantive and procedural issues that people have about. But let me say this, um, and we've had this discussion with a lot of our neighbors. We can go one of two routes. Option or door number one is the council does nothing. We deny the conditional use. Chick-fil-A can go into that location as a non-conforming use and there's nothing that we can do about traffic or patterns or parking or anything else because that has been a continuous restaurant for a period of time. Option number two is to go through a conditional use process where we work with, with the neighbors and obviously as much as reasonably possible, try and find a number of accommodations um, for the neighborhood, for people who live around there and do what, what it makes the most sense. Um, every time I've explained this, everybody has selected what's behind door number two as opposed to door number one. And, you know, um, my preference is to work with the neighborhood on this rather than policy being dictated to us on it. Um, so if anybody has any questions about that, I'll go to the next topic, which um, I've sort of talked about a little bit, but I want to address a little bit more substantively is uh, we had scheduled last week, but now are going to uh, have this week uh, a quality of life meeting. And the primary purpose for it is an ordinance that we will begin discussing and that I ultimately plan on introducing on encroachments. And the reason that I plan on introducing the ordinance is because I think whatever your view on the pedestrian walkway, there was a deep frustration with process and how that process unfolded. And so the ordinance would now provide much more consistency as well as predictability about different types of encroachments ranging from those that are extraordinarily minor for example, a door that just opens up into a right-of-way um, as opposed to awnings or balconies or pedestrian walkways. The more significant the encroachment, including a pedestrian walkway, there will be a committee right now. The ordinance as drafted has 12 members. In my view, it needs to be an odd number um, either 11 or 13, so we don't have split votes, to um, discuss the purpose of what the encroachment is, why it's needed, 
you have departments such as property management, Department of Public Works, NOPD, NOFD, Energy, Sewage and Water Board, the full litany of departments that are, are handling this. And those meetings would A, be publicly available, and B, anybody who wants to comment would be allowed to and have a voice in the process. So um, I think this is a pretty significant change from what happened in the past. Uh, obviously, I cannot address the rules that we inherited, but what I can do is try and provide something that provides a lot more consistency and predictability so there isn't guesswork involved and sort of like to and Mary's earlier comment about um, the bike paths, this will now give residents for the more significant um, encroachments and ability to engage a committee that will first hear these before anything happens. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? What all falls into the category of encroachments? So that's a good question, Chris. Um, there's there's a number of different ones, and again, they range from from very very minor, like doors that literally open up onto a city right of way. Another one that would not require review of the committee would be if there's ramps that have to be extended for ADA purposes onto a right of way. And then as you start to get um, more, what I would call onerous or, or, or bigger um, awnings that extend into the public right of way, constitute an encroachment. Um, of course, everybody will remember the sort of the debate about the French Quarter uh, balconies that are over a public right of way constitute um, an encroachment. I should also pause and say, obviously for property that is in the VCC and HDLC as well, that, that those agencies will be involved too. Um, and then the last sort of major one is pedestrian walkways. Um, you know, the administration's view is that, um, you know, I, I think, can't remember if it's schools or universities and, and hospitals are sort of the primary places where they would go. Um, but even within that, Chris, like they would have to submit a traffic plan, why alternate um, traffic rerouting doesn't work, et cetera. So again, it's it's the more um, the more I guess that something, and I hate to use the word encroaches, but the more something is truly over a public right of way or becomes a, a potential issue is when it gets elevated to this committee that then would have review before anything were to happen. Would that involve also maybe scaffolding, semi-permanent or temporary type construction structures? I know that can impede a lot of people's progress on sidewalks and walkways in certain areas. I mean, I know they're temporary in nature, so maybe just temporary permitting, but um, maybe something that regulates them or, or requires them to abide by certain things to accommodate mobility. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't remember that scaffolding itself was in there, but I'm happy to talk. I have a couple of things that I'm some cleanup that I'd like to do with the administration. Like, for example, we did have a discussion that I thought the committee either needed to be 11 or 13 people and I got 12 back. So that needs to be fixed or one or two other ones. I'm happy to ask about that as well. And Chris, you make a really good point too, which is it's not just automatically goes to the committee, right? It has to uh, have an application for a permit first. The smaller ones could just go through the regular permitting process. And then the ones that are again, um, bigger, I won't say more egregious, but that are bigger, would by definition um, require not only the application process and potentially some additional criteria, but then ultimately the review by the by the encroachments committee or task force. And guys, honestly, um, if, if this comes to fruition, this neighborhood's a big reason for that happening. I mean, this is a citywide thing. There will be a part two um, for retroactive purposes, mainly for um, balconies in the French Quarter that need inspecting on a more regular basis. But I, 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 I want this neighborhood to know um, that I took and continue to take very seriously what happened and sort of the, the, the frustration I feel like more with 
not feeling as though it was heard or that it was a fait accompli early on. And the purpose of the legislation, like I said, is to make sure that um, that doesn't happen front end and that there's a defined process that this has to go through. All right. Um, then I have two more things. Um, uh, one I think I hope to be quick about is everybody's seen turbine four and five are down right now. Um, we are working on a more substantive power source um, other than the turbines. Uh, my hope is within the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about that in a public way. And, and uh, for those of you who are wondering what I mean, there's sort of two parts to that. One is the mayor has, through fair share and other funding sources, um, will have allocated to the city money for a turbine seven. Um, that will be the first new turbine that we will have since post Katrina. So that is a big deal. And then the other piece of that is, is a permanent substation that is a transmission site that will get 60 megawatts worth of power by itself with the goal being that the substation is the primary source of power at all times and the turbines become um, the backup power as needed. Uh, and and I, to get into the weeds a little bit, Sewage and Water Board, what they would like to do is, um, you know, they need them all turbine one, um, assuming they can get four and five up and running in the next couple of months, eventually put those out to pasture, and then you'll have turbine six and seven, and then try and find pathways for turbines eight or, or nine or something else that is a power source potentially um, that that will replace this infrastructure that is 80, 90, 110 years old, right? But the point telling you all this is, you know, I heard the earlier discussion about green infrastructure, um, but in addition to that, we have to have a power source for clean drinking water and for stormwater management. And, and I think we're, we're very close to being on a pathway for that happening. And I wanted to discuss that. Yeah, now, Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Was turbine four mostly for drinking water system, water turbine, delivery? Yeah, turbine four. That's primary purpose. the The, the issue has been, and and I'm and I'm not saying this to unfairly criticize Sewage and Water Board. Um, they told us the public that turbine four would be up in um, in May, and that turbine five would be ready in the middle of this month. Well. Turbine four is not functioning properly and they had to order a new piece of equipment that has to be fabricated somewhere else. And turbine five, um, which is a workhorse turbine, uh, apparently is delayed because of steel production issues as a result of COVID. And so um, I, I, I never pray for somebody else to be hit by an invest or a tropical depression or a hurricane but I cross my fingers a whole lot um, when we see things in the Gulf. And obviously they did beyond a human's job last year when we were faced with similar circumstances. But my hope is that, that A, they get those up and running as quickly as they can as a stopgap solution. And then we have the longer term ones coming your way. Mary, you have your hand raised. Is it about this topic? You're muted. It is about this topic. I, I would just like to know, just for the record, whatever happened to the on-site mechanics and the on-site machine shops that the Sewage and Water Board used to have to do repairs to all of this equipment right there? Um, I've just never understood the problems they're having nowadays because they can't get parts and can't get you know, replacements or fixing. Uh, when they used to be able to do it all in-house. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the answer, Mary, is they still have machinists and they still have um, some things that they can fabricate internally. Again, this is my understanding, is that some of the parts are so big or, or um, require things that even those machinists can't provide, and so they have to outsource it. Now, one of the questions you're inherently asking that I'm also curious about is this. And I think Chris was sort of hinting at this too. 
if you have a turbine that is 100 years old and another one that isn't far behind, um, should you be on basically an emergency basis with your vendors, right? And say, look, at a moment's notice, and obviously at a moment's notice may still take a week or two, but we need to do something differently because this isn't just like we ran out of paper clips. It's this is this is the most important equipment we have for the entire city, and therefore it needs to be fast tracked. So, Mary, I, I I agree with you. And sort of one of the internal questions I have is what are they doing um, to facilitate it? And and you know, one of one of the other questions is like what would happen if turbines four and five are down and then turbine one went down too? And let's just say turbine six went down. You know, what would I know? I know last year the state provided us some additional backup power in addition to everything we had. But, at, you know, at, at, at this point, um, as I said at the last meeting, when we were dealing with the Boyle Waters Advisory. I think our attitude has to be, and, and not because of the people who work there, but because the equipment is so old, we should be at a Murphy's Law proposition. Right. We should assume if it can go wrong, it will. And therefore, we should have belt suspenders duct tape bubble gum everything ready that we need to make sure this is running properly thank you yeah and, and i guess chris just very quickly to wind up unless somebody has a question um I, I know this won't come as a great surprise to many of you but i've been doing this at my neighborhood meetings um i will be seeking re-election in the fall um it's been a pleasure representing um, you and obviously this is a district uh, or part of the district that council member Banks and I share and uh, I'd love to continue serving you and, and would love to have your support. So um, thank you very much for letting me be here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, council member. Uh, any questions, comments for council member Russo? Also, his uh, direct office contact information. Hey, Sorry, hey, do we have somebody speaking up? I think Kim's trying to speak up. Kim, I think you're on mute. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Red microphone button on the bottom left of your screen. Unfortunately, you have to do it because I can't do it for you. <laughs> No. Kim, you can also, if you want to, if you want to type in something too, maybe I can do that or just send me an email or call me so that, that way we can. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Shafley, have your hand raised? Did you want to come off mute as well? I want to apologize for this tool. I know they keep moving things around, but uh, you know, it's what we kind of settled our horse or hitched our horse to, hitched our wagon to, hitched our wagon to. I think that's how it goes. Kim, no luck. Hey, Michelle, um, uh, I see your question. I was getting ready to type my email in. Council Member Banks addressed that before with Mary, and I know he said, we're very aware of it and want to make sure the neighborhood's viewpoint is, is heard on, on the, on the bicycle lanes. Uh, and I'm going to put in my, my, I know Chris has included it within the agenda, but I'm going to send everybody my email, and my phone number. So everybody has it. Yeah. Sorry for the complications, everybody. Um, I mean, maybe we'll have to have a an early joint session, maybe make sure everybody's working appropriately. So the new working group, how does it affect current bike lane plans? 
Um, I'm not sure that it really does. I know there is the new working group um, that is part of, I mean, first of all, the working group, I don't think is, is that new. If I remember correctly, they just weren't doing it before. Um, and, and secondly, uh, and, and, and help me out, has there already been the public meeting that is now required? Um, um, because I know that was the that was the major piece that I amended the ordinance from after Marconi, right? That it happened without and also what happened on Moss Street over the summer um, is 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 much like the encroachments um, what's going on. And 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 Mary, I saw your question. I think they're only meeting four times a year um, because there's only so much work that's being done at any one time right now. I mean, the other thing, just so people sort of know practically is we've been asking for some striping and painting um and and trying to get that in other parts of our district like us proactively asking for it and the administration keeps on saying well until we sell bonds that's not really happening anytime soon so my point in saying that is um i think it's good to have your radar up and to watch what's going on uh but i don't see a lot of probable bicycle work being done um, without those bonds being sold, because I think that's the primary vehicle for getting that to happen. I, I think Council Member Banks, all right, so this is a lot, I know, I know you got another question. So, I mean, I think the biggest issue is just keep on making your voice heard on this issue. I mean, I think that's what Jay said too, which is, um, you know, we we hear a lot from from people on on issues. I mean, I've I've gotten absolutely lit up today about a variance on Moss Street, and it, most of the people who are emailing me know that the council isn't involved because it goes to the VZA and Civil District Court, but they still want me to know their feeling about it, which I appreciate. I I want to know that. So I think the same thing is true whether. It's a sewage and water board issue, whether it's a lighting issue, whether it's a safety and permits issue, or whether it's this. And and I, you know, I I realize that there there are people who advocate on behalf of things, but you know, neighbor voices are very powerful. And I would just remind you um, that there was a plan to you know make a lot of the streets closed off and um, and and go one way. And and I would say. You know your voices are were, were a significant um if not a superseding factor in getting that tamped back down um so keep on keep on doing what you're doing all right uh some more raise some more hands are raised uh mr reed hey can you hear me now yes Grabbing the button. Uh, thanks for this. I'm not too sure if this is the right uh, opportunity to bring this up, uh, Chris. We emailed back and forth before the meeting about. Um, there's a lot of. I think I brought this up to your office before, Joe, as well about the uh, the drug activity that's on uh, Bienville and North Gayoso. It's right outside Adams Food Store, the the blue store right here. Um, this is something that we've really been struggling with for the the community and I for about two or three years. I know it's been going on longer than that, and. Uh, we've contacted NOPD, we've contacted Mid-City Security District, I've contacted the mayor's office. I'm sort of running out of numbers to call and people to bother about this. Um, I'm just not, I would like some some steer and appreciate some advice on what to do next on, on how to manage this. We've got guys openly dealing drugs. They've got guns on them. There was a shooting not too long ago. I'm not too, you probably remember there were two were killed um, earlier this year because of this. Uh, and... It, it seems to be getting worse over the past couple of months and we're just at, at our wits end really the neighborhood here and what to do next yeah so um we're, we're happy to discuss this with you and i know avis and and matt are on the phone for district b um we we've dealt with this issue in the past let, let me just ask this question does the food store itself have an alcohol beverage license to they do and they do sell and they, they consume alcohol up and down the streets here and and so we get all of the trash from that and the other thing that's it's fairly I, I assume it's fairly recent maybe i've just noticed it since we've been working from home but because they don't have a um a bathroom inside adams all the guys who are drinking all day out here are using our front yards and side yards as a bathroom it's pretty disgusting 
Yeah, I mean, we've we've you know we dealt with this issue in in Dixon and in the and there's two pieces to it. one and one is I don't know the answer to because it's outside our district is sometimes things get slowed down because the federal government is involved and they're looking for bigger charges than the state has and that and I I I have had to push both in Dixon and Leonidas to kind of get through that issue as they do it. The second thing is I, I hear all the departments that you're saying. But I think the way that you might want to go, and, and, and I'm also talking to Avis and Matt about this, is the mayor's, um, the mayor's office in the law department has um, a lawyer or lawyers dedicated to ABOs, to alcohol beverage outlets, and they can bring to bear not only their resources, but code enforcement, NOPD, NOFD, um, and and you know, when they get involved, they can have a multidisciplinary approach um, where this is problematic. So, um, and, and one of the things we've seen is if the problem has been chronic, then a store, you know, that is violated, clearly violated, its conditional use has, has typically led to that no longer happening. So um, I'm happy to, to talk more with Jay and his office about this. And uh, speak with them about the roadmap we've used to try and deal with this in the past. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, a couple more still raised hands. Uh, Mary, do you have something else? Uh, nowhere near as, as important as that, but just for your interest, one of the Complete Streets meetings I went to said the section of Bienville they were talking about was on a different kind of funding than city bonds. I, and he did not explain what that was, just for your interest. You know, Mary, that, that, that is interesting. And one of the things, it's funny you bring that up, that I was sort of toying with in my head this morning is I, I don't often know where every piece of, of work that's being done in the district falls, right? So like most of the work right now is through the federal government and funded by the FEMA dollars um, as uh, that's going on. But then there's old bond money, there's new bond money, sometimes there's state money. And so one of the things I'm wondering is if we need a more forward looking piece on, on road work or something else that describes the available capital and how it's being spent down and what it's being used for, because I, I don't even know all the time, right? And 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 that can be an, an issue. I do know, for example, on Marconi, the the money was part of either a state or a federal grant, and so um, you know it wasn't primarily city money, and that's why they did it. So um, let's see what we can find out. All right, anyone else? All right, great seeing everybody tonight. I'll stay on for a little while longer, although I'll go mute and dark for a little while, but I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good seeing everyone. All right, thank you, Council Member. All right, uh, Ms. Brooks? I wanted to uh, make sure we still save time for you, even though we didn't uh, end up having our meeting today at Success Prep. But uh, please introduce yourself and tell us about your community school. No problem. My name is Tiffany Brooks. I'm the Director of Operations at Success at Thurgood Marshall at 462 on Canal Street. Um, I, some of you do look familiar from voting days. <laughs> but with that being said, we're really excited to host you all in person at our school today. And we hope you all hold your meetings at our campus and see what we've done with the place since we've been in position for the last few years. And also just to go ahead and say that we are a community school. We do bring kids in from all over Orleans to really access quality education. We firmly believe that education is freedom and that equity in education is what we stand for. So as you speak to your community, as you speak to your school-age children, friends that may have school-age children, keep success at Thurgood Marshall in mind because we firmly believe in educating the whole child. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we really wanted to do that and we will definitely, uh, you know, as, as we're, everyone's comfortable with uh, loosening up some of our cautions, we'll definitely move back indoors. We might be required to, 
if we have too many more <laughs> excessive heat days um, on the calendar. Well, we're uh, happy to host you and our AC works all the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, I believe they, uh, they're going to be hosting the next Mid-City Security District meeting. Are they confirmed for Tuesday the 22nd as of today? Confirmed for, um, I last heard, excuse me, I last heard the 21st. Oh, 21st. Um, okay. But I am, one of our neighbors right behind us on Iberville is the Secretary, Ms. Mary. So I'm going to circle up with her and just confirm a few things, but we're ready to host anytime. Uh, Mr. Willie, we have time for you now. If you if you don't want to, uh, if you have time to chime in. All right. Um, I mean, we'll we'll be back. We'll be here for probably another ten or fifteen minutes if you can circle back around. But thank you, Ms. Brooks. Um, we're definitely looking forward to meetings in the future um so please make note uh i did put a kind of a placeholder i know mid-city security district had to reschedule their uh monthly meeting that would have normally be held uh this coming wednesday the 16th so please look for any updates uh their website and facebook page are in the agenda items um i kind of through a bunch of things in there, but there are a few topics I wanted to touch on uh, and also include some information that council member um, Drew Russo touched on. Um, his office has been getting a lot of feedback about uh, the Chick-fil-A location. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew the CPC public hearing is scheduled for July the 13th, and this is the direct method and hearing date you must submit public comment for and by using that zoning docket uh, reference number. Um, there's a few outstanding um, land use items that are included in the agenda. Uh, a few applications and MPPs have moved on to uh, having hearings and some are just kind of stuck in limbo. Uh, I wish I could give you more updates. Sometimes it's a, uh, it's a delay in staff reporting. Sometimes it could be uh, the applicant has not responded to required materials um, from staff to build those reports. Um, or sometimes it could have just uh, rescinded their application altogether. But a few are coming up. Um, some of the most important ones, uh, I don't know specifically the, the item, but I know since the federal court's ruling on the building of uh, the Medical Services Center at Orleans Parish Prison uh, has been ruled to force to move forward. Um, they're going through all their proceedings for the required land use uh, variances because they're seeking a few things as far as size and scale with that project. Um, this is, I don't know if this counts as part of their NPP, but it's definitely uh, an outreach effort organized from uh, the city and with um, and with uh, the sheriff's department uh, moving forward and the developers hired to construct uh, that facility. Um, so that is coming up on uh, Thursday, June 17th at 6 p.m. So please tune in. Uh, this, you know, this falls in the boundaries of within Mid-City. Uh, the jail is something that we signed on to to oppose as an organization based on scope and uh, kind of circumventing the required meeting and requirements for the process to build a new structure. Um, and so we definitely have been involved in the past. Um, as you can see, there's there's two, two items, uh, 617 North Broad, uh, conditional use for retail package alcohol, and 3120 Cleveland are both on the hearing date on June 20th. Uh, you can see that further down the agenda. And then also I've already linked to um, the zoning docket number and information for 4068 Tulane Avenue. Uh, I know we had a lot of community input and um, resistance to the initial application of 217 South Rendon. Um, there has not been any movement on that. Um, if you look at the one-stop application, there's over over 20 plus public comments already to be entered into the record with that staff report. So obviously those immediate neighbors have been uh, dutifully working 
um, to get the to get uh, an organized opposition to that application. So no hearing date has been announced. I don't know if they've if there's any communication between them and the applicant. I don't know if the applicant has withdrawn. Um, but that's that's the only update I can see from the public, uh, not specifically reaching out. Um, yeah, so please follow those. Uh, always uh, sign up for these. Um, oops. You notice me alerts. This will keep you up to date. I mean, uh, it will even now alert you to any building permits. Uh, so any building permits that are permitted by right. Kim, I can hear you now. Yeah, I know, huh? <laughs> it, no, it wasn't even... I don't know. I, I kept fiddling with it until I got it. I'm sorry. I interrupted your conversation. No problem. <laughs> uh. um, yes, and so and also detailed the uh, the mechanisms on how to make public comment uh, in the agenda as well. But uh, these notice me alerts are fantastic. Um, even if you're just curious about what new construction is going on, these will give you uh, notifications on whatever boundary area that you draw yourself as big or as small to your property and give you all adjacent building permits that are issued, as well as applications and MPPs that would um, that are required by changes or variances in zoning and land use. Um, I do have something to say about um, the Chick-fil-A, the NPP. Um, mm -hmm. So nothing's really been finalized yet because I hate to say I work at the bank and they acting like it's a done deal. So the hearing date for that is July 13th. It will not be yeah. heard any sooner than that. It would have to go through CPC approval and I believe then move on to uh, full city council to add any sort of conditions or provisos at that time. So definitely it's a good idea to submit requests for public comment to the CPC either for approval or denial specifically and if you have any other input to give on the property uh, as far as requirements for, for development or input on design process to also make that known um, to them and city council. And, and, and Chris, I'm sorry, just to add to that, I'm sorry sure. to put in, but nothing is done, uh, uh, you know, at all. And, and I mean, I, I I, I want the neighborhood feedback on how this process works. And Kim, as I explained earlier, my larger concern is if, is if we don't do anything, you're stuck with something that nobody can do anything about, period. Right? Well, we'll already have that. So, you know, I don't really trust the work. And I know y'all trying to correct things, but it didn't seem to work the proper channels last time. So I don't really have faith in things going differently on I, this I, project. I, I, know. I, I, no, I, I understand that. I guess my point is if there's zero conditional use whatsoever, they can basically do it. They can basically keep everything a status quo and there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. So right. my, my point is in a conditional use process, you can put prescriptions on there and, and work with whoever the applicant is to try and get the things the neighborhood is interested in as part of that. And, and that's the major difference here is in, in, in number one, if we do nothing and the conditional use fails, there's going to be a Chick-fil-A there. If, if just because that's how the property works, but if we work on a conditional use, then there are, there are things that have to be followed as a result that we can add as provisos that are, that are like agreements between the law. What happened with the bridge was not a conditional use. And so it's a different process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, I know what you're talking about. I still have no faith in things going I, the way the I, I understand that. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, look, you're not alone in not having faith in, in government or in process at all times. But I think, I, think there, I think there's sort of three different things. One, the walkway was 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 something that involved safety and permits and therefore very little council involvement and i've been very clear that the issues where i've gotten the most tied up have been safety and permits decisions that we don't control and then two without a conditional use 
you're going to have a Chick-fil-A. So then what do we do with the conditional use to try and get it to the best place possible? Well, it just seems that most everybody is concerned about traffic and yeah. congestion because of the veterans. Chick-fil-A is very instruct, you know, obstructs very many. I, 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 bad out there. And this is a very major, you know, area of traffic already. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, that's, that's I, the concern that I'm hearing from everyone that I know who has any opinion about Chick-fil-A is that, you know, it's going to make traffic horrendous and, and already area that's got issues. You know what I'm saying? I, I know exactly what you're saying. I use that Chick-fil-A as my point of reference the first time that I've ever discussed this. And again, it's why I keep on going back and forth between the two, that if there is no conditional use at all, there's nothing that can be done for traffic, period. There's zero. And the building stays where it is, and you may have traffic that's that bad. What we want to do is try and work on a conditional use that will help improve the flow of traffic. And then, and then look, you know, RPC is supposed to be doing something with the other side of the interstate on painting and other things to resolve that. I mean, obviously, we want to make sure that knowing that this is an issue, what can we do to best rectify it? Okay. I just had to say what everybody's been telling me, you know, that they how they feel. So I had to get that out there, you know. Mr. Klassen? Uh, yeah, I figured out how to turn my microphone on. I was not computer savvy. Uh, recently in the news, we've seen Austin Badon come on, and we've seen other people, the DA, trying to describe that uh, the people that are carrying weapons, every day they go out of their house, they come back in their house, they carry the weapon around town. So what I'm asking for feedback from people is the possibility of us working to create some kind of a public service announcement. I've started with the idea that it would be, the gun would be a cartoon character. He would sleep at night. He'd get up, he'd get his, his ticket to go eat at McDonald's. He'd go about town. He'd steal a car and he'd be driving his car in front of the cathedral. All these things would happen and he would come home and go to sleep at night. It would be like nobody even noticed. So the public service commercial would try to get more people involved in spotting people that have guns and trying to get action to get those guns off the street. I don't know if anybody thinks that's a workable idea, how to get that done on, on television, 30 second spots. Does that yeah. ring the bells? I don't have much experience with, with that as far as development or uh, churches mm -hmm. power, but I mean, partnering with other established groups would probably be best um, if Crime Stoppers or other groups have programs for, you know, public outreach. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about it and see what I can do to help. Okay. All right. Well, that that ended uh, land use items. Um, still trying to stay up to date on most of those things. But if you hear of anything or know anything, like um, or you know of any pending applications, uh, like none of us knew that the transfer of the sale of Lindy Box happened uh, what, last week. That was a <laughs> surprise for all of us. So um, yeah, please share it with with myself or the board. You can always get in touch with us uh, at. Uh, info at mcno.org or use the contact form on mcno.org. Um, we're always looking for more ideas and planning for these meetings. Um, you know, now we're going to settle into a more regular format to try and build out some of our attendees and maybe focus our, our topics on certain aspects. Um, any other comments or anyone else from the floor have anything else to say? Yeah, go ahead and chime in. Um, could I ask a question of another participant tonight? Um, if I don't know, is that okay with the participant? It's for Hank Hennigan. Oh, Hank, sure. can I ask you a question? <laughs> um, 
a lot of people in the area of Bethany Church have been very curious about two things. One, the massive amount of construction that's going on in the old parking lot. And two, they apparently have observed external speakers and they just would like to know what's up with both of those things. Okay, good question, Ms. Mary. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mary. Uh, the uh, parking lot uh, is going to be poured here pretty quickly in the next week or two weeks. And um, and all the landscaping inside, that's what they ask us to do from architectural standpoint. Uh, the speakers are outside. That will just be you know, Sunday morning, very low when when people are walking in, the pipe music, and then when when the praise and worship starts and preaching start, all that there will not be outside speakers being used at all. So it's just to kind of gather people in. Is that what it's for? Yeah, you know when. If, 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 um, they're walking their family in or walking their children in, just hearing a little melodious music, something, something very um, harmonious to to people. And, and when they, you know, when, when church starts, uh, the speakers will not be on. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. We're looking forward to it. It's... Uh, uh, you know, we're like uh, we're, we're constantly being pushed back the launch date because of um, uh, subcontractors getting parts and and cabinets and doors and this and that. So, um, you know, we're we're looking uh, in July, or maybe even August now. Mr. Hank, why don't you remind everybody your address? So they know what project you're talking about. 3700 Canal Street, uh, uh, Bethany Church. Um, this is a campus that we we purchased. Uh, it was a vacant Episcopal Church building there for for many years, and um, and uh, I'm in charge of campus expansion. We we're able to to secure it three years ago, and then uh, we raised funds. Uh, uh, our main campus is in Baton Rouge. If you go into Baton Rouge and you see three big crosses on the right as you go in on the interstate, that's our main campus. Our north campus, where it started in 1963, and Brother Roy Stocksteel's house is in Baker, north of the Baton Rouge Airport. Uh, we have a campus in uh, Livingston Parish uh, there that's uh, we've met in Walker High School for six years, and we have a campus on Juban Road now that's been in service for two years. We have a campus in Homa, and we're excited. I mean, we're so excited about uh, coming to, to New Orleans, and um, uh, we're we're really looking forward to being there in Mid City and and uh, being involved in service projects. I, I remember not in 2019 uh, during Mardi Gras when the pen, when the um, Endymion prayed passes down in front of Canal Street. That's the only one, I believe, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. we, we put, uh, 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 we rented a, a, a big trailer with, uh, with, with uh, for his and her restrooms and gave away about 10,000 free hot dogs and water bottles and everything. We just wanted to serve the community. That's what it's all about. Love Thank and you. serve the community. Thank you, Mr. Hannigan. Uh, Mr. Thomas? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if uh, in the future, can you have both um, in-person meetings and as well as the online meeting? You know, can can an online person uh, participate? Uh, I mean, all of our meetings in person or, or online are, you know, open to the public. Uh, we try and spread the word as much as possible. The, the technology to effectively run uh, and capture in-person audio and and also interact with people from a remote setting is challenging. Um, and I don't know specifics on how to effectively done it because I haven't seen it effectively done without, you know, a, a investment in some hardware. Um, but I'm more than willing to test out different things. You know, I, I don't want to say no to any possibilities for sure, but, um, and would love some input and some help in trying to facilitate.
what kind of, what came to mind is there was a DA's forum uh, put on by Lakeview Civic that was, I mean, it just they they were it was height of um, COVID restrictions. They were they were constricted by the amount of people they could let into St. Dominic's, and then um, and then had no accommodations to effectively produce audio um, to capture any of the sitting people for the forum. So um, it's kind of made an impression with me and I don't want to try and emulate it in any way. <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. Um, let's see, uh, I, oh, I'll go ahead and share something myself as, as we start to wrap up. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but there's some moving boxes uh, behind me. Um, so we're, I'm currently in the processes of closing on a home in the fairgrounds neighborhood, and I'll be moving on from mid city um, towards the end of July. So uh, I want to still assist and help out and transfer my knowledge and, and help uh, enlist more neighbors to come and get involved with MCNO and, and try and, uh, you know, keep neighbors involved and informed, but uh, I'm not going to be able to serve in the position of president uh, for too, too much longer. Um, so please uh, reach out if you're interested. There will be a coming vacancy on the MCNO board. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please reach out at info at mcno.org. Uh, that goes to the entire board email address. Um, and it would be up to the sitting board members to appoint a uh, someone to fill a vacancy when that comes up. So. Um, I'm still hoping to assist any way I can, but, uh, you know, that, that I want to, I want representation to be kind of the one defining thing of this organization is, is basically the geography. So if I'm no longer residing in the boundaries, um, then I don't feel like I'd appropriately, uh, try and represent, uh, neighbors concerns. So. All right. Um, the next uh, MCNO board meeting, speaking of which, is end of the month. Uh, if you need to present any business to the board, uh, please reach out. Same info at mcno.org. Um, we'll be meeting June 29th. We haven't discussed if that's going to be in person yet or not. Um, I know that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you still have your hand raised? Mr. Hank, you got a comment or question specifically to you from Ms. Shaffley about your contractor keeping the street clear on South Talamacus. Yes. And are you using gravel for the parking lot? No, there, the, the city required us to put two foot because we've got underground uh, uh, water storage and stuff for mm. runoff. And then uh, we had to put uh, two foot of limestone all across the parking lot. And, and we're getting ready to pour uh, concrete on top of the limestone. Oh, I'm think I'm I think I'm understanding Ms. Shaffley's comment. Can uh, better ways to keep the streets clear of your of any gravel being used on your construction site. I think that's the request. Keep the streets clear. Yeah, if uh, any spillover of any gravel or construction materials that end up in the street. Okay. If 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 um, we have a, a you know a contractor there, RKL, and, and, and if anybody has any uh, problems with that, um, I can give you my personal cell phone number and call me and I will talk to the contractor that's on site and get him to take care of it. Any problem like that that's that's causing on Telemachus, Cleveland, or anywhere, or, you know. And if you want to call me, my cell number is 225-229-6839. 225-229-6839. I live in Baton Rouge, but my heart is in New Orleans and I'm down there four or five days a week. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that hasn't stopped for MCNO is we've been selling merchandise like crazy, but we need some more ideas on what to create. Um, so we're calling for designs for t-shirts. We've depleted kind of our stock of, of our last designs and we're looking to um, facilitate some more designs on merchandise to sell. We currently have these hats 
still. We have a few face masks left over. Um, like I said, we pretty much depleted t-shirts except for a few limited sizes. And uh, of course we have our flags um, that we're running low in stock on. So please uh, reach out to us if you have any ideas or or if you want, if you have any design services or could offer any layout services to us. So I just want to also mention that there's plenty of opportunities to volunteer with our organization and throughout the neighborhood. So um, our next meeting is uh, Monday, August 9th. Uh, we typically take off July. Uh, I'm personally going to be out of town our week of the meeting. Um, if something else comes up, we, we will announce if we're having some sort of impromptu meeting for the month of July. Um, typically, where our calendar falls, we're always on the second Monday of the month, which falls pretty close to the July 4th holiday. And I know a lot of people try to get out of town in or around that date, and we see our most limited engagement as far as uh, you know, neighbors are concerned because everybody wants to beat the heat. <laughs> so maybe that wasn't as big a concern. Maybe it's not as big a concern now that we're meeting remotely, but when we were meeting in person, they were our least attended meetings <laughs> of the year. So that's been kind of our regular schedule. So if not, we'll see you in August. Um, and yeah, thanks for attending. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Glad to be here.